today's session, I'm going to explain you about uh, how we can manage data in a microservice uh, architecture. You know that most of the people are moving uh, from monolith to microservices or any other distributed uh, architecture styles. So uh, in this session, we'll see uh, how we can handle data in such a distributed architecture. Most of the systems uh, are using monolithic architecture style. So uh, I mean it's very simple. Uh, and you know it is easy to grasp and uh, more or less they are using uh, one single database. So most of the time uh, this database is an RDMMS uh, or relational database management system. Uh, so uh, when it comes to relational database management system we have one savior. So that savior is asset properties. When you are working uh, with a database which has asset properties you don't you do not need to worry too much uh, about data because since that it is using asset properties as mentioned in here the database management system itself takes care of uh, the uh, at, uh, the consistency and the uh, legitimacy of data when we are moving into a distributed architecture or distributed database management systems the one main principle that we would need to follow is the cap theorem now in the cap theorem as uh, described in here it has mainly three aspects the consistency availability and partition tolerance the most important thing is that uh, in a, any given database you can have only two of these there is uh, no uh, database system in the market uh, as of today that can uh, satisfy all these uh, three aspects uh, in in a one single database so as uh, if you take an example when you go into a traditional relational database kind of a things, you have the consistency and availability. But if you are working with consistency and partition tolerance, then these uh, MongoDB and Redis are the databases that you need to work with. And uh, if you are working with availability and partition tolerance only, then you have to go with uh, CouchDB or Cassandra. So uh, that uh, how you can select this database that entirely depend on uh, your business requirements or what you are trying to achieve in your distributed architecture. Now let's move into the world of microservices. I have seen in uh, most of the uh, microservices architectures that have been built uh, so far, I use this kind of a pattern or this kind of a ar architecture. So we have clients and we have a reverse proxy or API gateway to deal with uh, all the client requests. And we have set of services, but unfortunately, all these uh, independent microservices are connected to one database. So, is this a good practice? So, why? Uh, what are the problems that we are having in this kind of a setup? So, uh, it's no matter what that how many services that we do have uh, in this architecture, we have a single point of failure, which is the database. And we have a lot of performance bottlenecks as well because it doesn't matter like you know 100 or 200 services that we are having. The services can cater uh, their, serve, uh, their requirements independently uh, but uh, you know everything get bottlenecked into the database whenever that they want to do a data query or a data update or uh, anything related to data. So there is a performance bottleneck as well in this architecture and there is a service dependency as well because you know microservice uh, or any microservices architecture get empowered with autonomous autonomous is uh, autonomy is the one of the main principles in microservices so can you do autonomous service deployment such as you know we using ci cd pipelines and all that using this kind of architecture it is very hard because the, the thing is that if you change any uh, data aspect it can be affect to any many other microservices as well so you cannot deploy uh, any particular microservice independently to the production environment without affecting others because of the database dependency. So then uh, what we can do about this? So the simplest thing that we can do is uh, to have uh, one single database per one service uh, or else uh, we can have uh, you know minimum uh, services that is depend on one particular database. So how we can have this database? So initially we can have one database server and logically separated uh, databases 
as depicted in this picture. Uh, is this one is good? Of course, this one is better than the previous uh, architecture style that we had. But still, it has some problems. It has a still is a single point of failure because we have hosted or we have created all these logically separated database in one database server or one database infrastructure, and it has a noisy neighbor problem as well. As an example, think that uh, this uh, red uh, microservice has some uh, you know costly uh, query that is running in this particular database. Since that it is uh, hosted in uh, one database server, the the performance uh, impact of this uh, query can affect to other logically separated databases as well. But one of the plus points in this architecture style is the cost, because is that uh, you know we don't have to pay. Uh, different uh, database instances, so everything would be in one uh, database instance. So, it of course it is uh, reducing your cost to the database. So, this one is good whenever that you are uh, trying to deploy uh, your uh, architecture or your database uh, platform on your own infrastructure. So, because you know you can have uh, you can closely monitor these things and uh, do. Uh, whatever the uh, changes uh, that you can do uh, whenever that there is a problem and uh, you know more or less uh, frankly speaking this is good for on-premise kind of a uh, microservices deployment. So to solve uh, the problems that we are having in this uh, particular architecture we can have uh, physically separated databases. So uh, since that these all these databases are physically separated uh, one particular database's uh, performance or any other failure would not affect to any other database. So uh, this is uh, this particular architecture is very good uh, whenever uh, that you are trying to uh, have uh, data independency in between uh, these services and these uh, databases. But the cost would be a problem because uh, if uh, I mean let's say for an example that you want to take a license, so you have to take a database license for each and uh, every of these database uh, service or servers and uh, this one is good whenever that uh, you are trying to uh, do your data deployment uh, on cloud because uh, you know that we can uh, uh, I mean you don't have to uh, maintain uh, of costly database servers and all that when you go into cloud but we can uh, do some uh, database service we can use database services which uh, offered by many cloud providers if you want to have uh, this kind of an architecture. The main advantage in this architecture is the data independence. Let us go and see what are the other consequences or other problems that can occur in this kind of a uh, microservices architecture. So uh, as an example, let us say that there are two services, order service and the customer service. So there is a query coming into the order service asking about uh, the uh, name of the top uh, purchase that has been made uh, in the last week. So, uh, what we can do is if you think in a traditional uh, way of uh, database architecture, we can have a join in between the uh, customer table and the order uh, table. So, uh, what we can do is you can have a query with the join and retrieve the uh, customer name. So, can we do this thing? Uh, in uh, in this kind of a microservice architecture. You know, the most important thing that you have to think in here that these two databases are separate each other. You know, they are physically separated. So, we cannot have any kind of a join in between these two uh, tables. So, we cannot do this thing. And the other thing that we can do is the order service can, uh, you know, get the uh, top uh, uh, amount here or the top order here and get the customer ID and have a separate query to the customer table to retrieve the customer name. Can we do this thing? I mean technically we can do this thing but this is a big no no in microservice architecture because in this case uh, the uh, order service also depends on the customer table. So this is I mean this kind of a uh, cross service uh, database calls are not advised in any microservices architecture. So, uh, then what we can do? We can, uh, the order service can directly call into the customer service and tell, hey, give me the uh, name of the customer names, ID, uh, 
uh, or, or the customer name for the ID to it. So in that case, we can retrieve uh, this uh, customer name. So this is the most uh, appropriate way of retrieving data uh, in between two microservices. So is this good? There is a still problem in here, the latency. Okay, think that you know, uh, now in this example, we have taken only one customer. Think that you have to do this thing for uh, 10 million uh, customers. So there is a problem with that. So how we can, uh, wh what is the solution that we can have for this latency problem? So the one solution that we can uh, give is to maintain a server side cache. So in the, in the server side cache, uh, we can uh, get rid of the database call from the uh, customer service. But still, the network call is there. And it will, I mean, this would be uh, ease of data validation as well because if there's any change that have been made into the customer table, since that it is uh, the cache is maintained in the server, uh, easily uh, the database can uh, give a notification to the uh, to this cache and update the cache. And the uh, efficient memory management is also there because in this, it is in the server side. But still, the network call is there. So one other solution that we can have is maintain a client side cache. So we can, uh, during the design time, we can determine uh, what are the data elements that frequently need uh, in the order service uh, from the customer service and uh, may uh, and upload them or maintain uh, those data as a caching service in the client side. So uh, the advantages in this approach is that there is no, no network call at all. So there is a, in terms of performance, there is a definite gain. Uh, and uh, there is no, uh, I mean, the resiliency is also there. As an example, think that customer service goes down, still we can uh, retrieve this uh, data which is in the cache. So it, it is not depending on the customer service anymore for this frequently accessed data. But uh, one uh, disadvantage that we are having in this approach is invalidation and update issues. Think that there is a change that have been made into this customer table, you know, updating. Uh, this uh, particular client cache is not trivial, it's not straightforward. So uh, we'll see uh, what are the uh, methods that we have in this kind of a uh, update. Uh, the most uh, efficient way of doing is uh, doing this operation is using a CDC tool or the uh, change data capturing tool. So one example that I can give you is uh, DBCM. So DBCM is a uh, nice uh, the CDC tool that we can use and it supports uh, many uh, database platforms as well. So what is it doing is it just uh, going through the uh, database log uh, for each and every transaction and it can trigger an event. So uh, in this tool, uh, you know, you can uh, after that uh, you capture the uh, data change and you can raise that event into a message broker or a simple queue. So then uh, this uh, caching service or the order service can uh, subscribe into this uh, event stream and update the cache accordingly. So uh, this is, uh, but you know, there is a little bit of problem here. Now, uh, in, in this case, you have to think about eventual consistency because you cannot uh, assume that as soon as the customer service updates anything in the customer uh, database, uh, that you cannot assume that it is, you know, straight away it's going to be reflect in the caching itself. Eventually, uh, the cache should get updated. So this is eventual consistency is, you know, one of the most important aspect when it comes to the distributed data management. Now let's think about a reporting scenario. So assume that there is a reporting service which requires data from both of these services. So uh, since that, assume that, you know, this particular reporting, it requires maybe, you know, 100 million records. So uh, when, if, this particular reporting service as this data from the main service itself, it might affect to the performance of this uh, main service or the order service. Because uh, assume that you know there are other requests that are coming into this order service. In the meantime, this reporting service asking for hundred million uh, records. So of, of course, it is affecting to other functionalities. So how we can uh, give a solution into this kind of a scenario? So these are the problems that we have. We have the high latency, uh, as I explained, it might affect other transactions uh, and it needs to fetch data on each report request as well. So assume that there are 10 uh, managers who request uh, this report, particular report in 10 different times. So of 
first that we need to uh, do this operation 10 times. So how we can give a solution into this? So uh, then again, uh, that we can use a, a CDC tool uh, to update uh, a message broker such as Kafka to uh, notify all the changes. And uh, the reports, uh, the reporting service can cache or it can uh, keep the uh, data that have been updated in the as an event stream. So in these event streams, you can uh, query this data whenever uh, required uh, by the reporting service. One technology that you can use uh, for this uh, event streaming query is KSQL DB. So this one is uh, you know highly go par with uh, event streams such as uh, Kafka streams and uh, you can uh, query all these uh, event streamings or event sources using KSQL DB. So it is you know it is uh, same as the other regular uh, SQL uh, queries but the only difference is that instead of tables and all it is querying a stream processing. Now let's uh, discuss how you can uh, migrate uh, your monolithic database into a microservices database because you know I know that most of the uh, systems uh, are started uh, from monolith and then eventually when the number of users are getting increased when the number of uh, uh, you know the data rows are getting increased then they decide into moving into microservice so uh, what we can do in here so the simplest thing that we can do is have built a separate uh, microservice for customer service and move all the uh, data elements or the uh, database into a, a, a separate database such as in customer database. But can we do this thing? Of course we can do this but what are the implications? So as Martin Fowler said if you do a big bang rewrite the only thing that you are certain of a, is a big bang because I mean you cannot do this thing overnight because you know moving uh, data is much more complex than moving your code logic into a separate microservice. Because data there is high dependency and you know if you get corrupt data after you moving then uh, you know you cannot go back. So uh, then what you can do? You, you need to do this thing gradually. So let me explain that. So first of all what we need to do is you need to create uh, an API where it exposes this uh, customer data from the main database. And then you can create your uh, customer service to retrieve this data from this customer API. So remember that still we have everything in, in our main database. So uh, and then later we can uh, have the customer database created and then we can use uh, a CDC tool or any other ETL technology to move uh, this data into the uh, customer database. You can see that still the customer API is still there and uh, the customer service is still uh, querying uh, the customer uh, API for the uh, data retrieval. So what we can do is you can have some kind of a interim gray period or testing period in uh, in between uh, these two data sources. One from a, I mean what, what are the data that is coming from API and what are the data that is there in the customer database. So you can make sure after like you know uh, running this thing for few weeks or few months time then you can make sure that the data consistency is there. Then finally you can get rid of uh, this API and uh, main database or the dependence of the main database and have a uh, independent uh, microservice with independent data source. So this is uh, the you know the best way to move your data into a separate microservices. Actually this one is referred to as a strangler fit pattern as well when it comes to uh, microservice migrations. So guys that concludes uh, this session and thanks for uh, listening to this thing and if you want to dig deep and you know find uh, more uh, resources about this so these are the uh, three main books that I can re recommend and these are the you know the examples and everything that I have taken from these books uh, microservice for enterprise and my, uh, monolith to microservice by Sam Newman and refactoring database. Thank you.